I'm John Griffith. The Occupy movement has been something of a blitz across the country, and it's even echoed sparks around the world. Uh, before we introduce tonight's guests, I want you to take a look at this video. at the Occupy movement um, across America, around the world. Um, a lot of people really, because of media mismanagement, don't know what the Occupy movement is all about. And I have, we have, <laughs> two incredible people who are involved in the movement, uh, local homegrown people from Queens, one of whom you've seen on the show a few times before, both of whom I've known for more than half my life, uh, the brothers Alexandro. Hi guys. Rich welcome and Ted, welcome. Show. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Uh, so, for for the uninitiated, what what is the Occupy movement? That's a broad question. I, <laughs> I guess uh, I would describe it as kind of a um, b based in in class, really. Uh, I guess it's for the first time that people are taking a look at class and seeing how money is largely being siphoned in one direction over the past 30 years or so and more intensely in the last 10 years or so uh, so that there's a shrinking middle class and workers rights are being eroded so I think this is kind of a uh, an answer to all of that that people are realizing that something is askew and Wall Street is kind of the uh, embodiment of that corporate America and the kind of uh, shady relationship between government and big corporations do you think that there was a particular spark that kicked it off? Uh, 
I think the cue was probably taken, you know, from the Middle East, the uprising over there. Um, I just think of it as like a new conversation. You know, I, I always come back to the word conversation um, because that's what was happening, you know, when we first got there. It was just people having conversations, and you could see like passers-by, and like uh, to use that word spark, you would see people like wow, we, we can do this? We can get together and talk about politics and, uh, you know, the, the unequalness that's going on uh, in our society. Um, and then from there, you know, like new words have entered the lexicon, like 1%, 99%. Uh, terms like living wage that people haven't been, you know, or you're uh, working poor, mm. you know, stuff like that has now come to prominence. I think those are dirty words that they don't, they don't, the media or whatever, whomever doesn't want us to hear, working poor and stuff like that. Mm. And I like, I like how you describe it as a conversation because I think, I think there's a misconception that it's um, just a bunch of rabble rousers or hippies or, you know, whatever. But I like that you make it so, one, accessible and two, civilized. Because a conversation is a civilized thing, I think. Yeah, I think anybody that spent a lot of time at Zuccotti Park. Uh, you know, obviously that was the hub to begin with. Um, you know, you hold your signs, you have your conversations, and you have your passers-by. Some of them are sympathetic, some of them aren't. But, um, yeah, there's that perception. People would walk by and say, get a job, you know. There are none. And, uh, and we would say, well, we all have jobs, you know. Everyone that we hang out with, you know, and goes down, and now we're in Occupy Astoria, everyone is well-educated and well-employed, you know, so there's that huge misconception, you know, that they're a bunch of bums and they don't even know how to, you know, use the toilet and they're urinating all over the place and, you know, all those New York Post stories. Yeah, which was going to bring me to my next point. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, media manipulation, um, depend mostly from sources that call themselves news but are more geared toward infotainment than actual news sources. Um, there have been some legitimate reporters that have picked up on the actual stories of the people who are part of the movement, but not necessarily enough. Um, do you think that's still flowing in that direction, or is it just sort of, uh, you know, waves on the shore? I, I think that, you know, th the news, um, the mainstream news, uh, as well, I wouldn't. I, I don't know if most people know, but uh, certainly a lot of people in, in the Occupy movement know that uh, five to seven big media conglomerates control pretty much everything that we see, read, listen to, uh, all of that. So it's being filtered through a for-profit media company or system. Um, so they're always going to be looking for the sexy angle, the sexy story, the conflict. Um, you know, whereas actual reporting probably lies somewhere in between. Um, but if I think a lot of reporters probably would rather play it safe than jeopardize their career by seeming like a sympathizer or, you know, why are you following up on this story? Like the story has to be huge mm -hmm. in order for it, it to get coverage, like when 700 people got arrested on the Brooklyn Bridge all of a sudden they were covering the Occupy movement. Did anything change overnight? No, uh, but there was a sexy lead story, 700 arrests. So those are the kinds of things that I think the media gravitates towards. Uh, the actual storyline behind it, uh, the conversation that's taking place is probably a little more laborious mm -hmm. and less sexy a news story, but that's really uh, the nuts and bolts of what's been taking place. What I read was just the thing that I liked about it was, one, it's, I don't think it's anything for people to be afraid of, because it is 99% of us, you know, but the fact that there was a kitchen there, people were fed, clothed, you could get books. When, when, um, when people were in Zuccotti Park, I was on the train one night, and the, one of the coolest things ever, I'll never forget, it was such a New York moment, but it's such a wonderful moment. There were two Occupy people going through the train with handing out newspapers, Occupy Wall Street newspaper. And the greatest thing about it was I looked up, I got the newspaper, I said thank you, and everybody on the train was looking at that paper. 
it was amazing mm -hmm. to see that. And then imagining that whole A train full of people reading that paper and getting a little bit of news that they wouldn't normally get, they wouldn't have the access to it. I think it's, it's not going to go away anytime soon. I don't think it should. And I think that's so important is uh, like that Occupied Wall Street Journal was put out by folks there. So I think that's been a big part of the movement, not only in the States, but globally, is social media, Twitter, mm -hmm. Facebook, getting the actual people on site, uh, you know, kind of becoming the media mm -hmm. so that there is an honest representation of here, here's the live stream, you know, uh, here's the people tweeting from right. a march or from some sort of event so that it's, it's authentic and you know it's not filtered through um, a media outlet with some sort of agenda. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, there's been police pushback against media as well at, at some of the events. And you know, as we saw in the video, quite a number of those have turned very sour. Well, yeah. it's, uh, it was very noticeable to us um, as winter wrapped up and the first uh, marches, rallies, get togethers were going on that. The police had been directed to uh, ramp it up with us and have the sticks out and push people around and do more random arresting. Um, so, yeah, you just wonder what goes on behind closed doors. And, uh, you know, the big chant a lot of times is who do you protect, who do you serve, you yeah. know? And uh, I think, you know, it's kind of a rhetorical <laughs> question. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think also the fact that, you know, uh, the, the cops, as they know and as we all know, are, are blue collar, you know, 99% um, mm -hmm. uh, folks. So uh, they take orders from the higher ups, and who knows how high up those orders really go. I don't know if it's Bloomberg or, uh, you know, Ray Kelly, whoever gives those orders th there were there was a noticeable shift on several occasions in the uh, demeanor of the cops and their tactics um, so yeah that's not decisions that they're making in the heat of the moment that's a strategy mm -hmm. uh, and we could see the strategy get more violent and more aggressive um, yeah and, and also a disconnect in their tone like initially in those first weeks and months even uh, you could have conversations with the cops that were assembled there it was all very civil um, but then there was that shift where I guess they were directed, don't engage with the protesters. You know, once this really had legs and it was becoming mm -hmm. a national story, they were clearly told, you know. They wanted an us versus them kind of situation. Yeah, or d just kind of, you're not a person down there for the cops. You're not a person down there. You're just carrying out orders. Don't talk to them. Don't engage. So there was a disconnect, mm -hmm. um, yeah, which, which was obvious. You feel it's like they're, you know, they're trying to herd the animals? Yeah, I think there, it was twofold. I think the higher ups knew that if the cops did talk, you know, th that there would be a lot of common ground. Um, so I think they knew it, w it, w it was in their best interests to not have the police force having any kind of discourse with the protesters. Um, so I think it was that, and I think also, yeah, they wanted to kind of just have them in the mode of like, let's get these animals herded. Yeah, <laughs> like get this under control. Right. I think it also, uh, there's so many prongs that you could look at. There, it, in, it incites fear, and it also takes people off message. You know, now we start to concentrate on police brutality instead of what we really should be concentrating on, the corruption and the greed in government and corporations. So those are two right. huge things that they can accomplish. Uh, I think the positive way that we can look at it is, okay, the more brutal they get, and the more dehumanizing, uh, violent they get, to me that means we're doing something right, you know? We're hitting a nerve, right. um, and they realize the potential of the movement, so that's why they're reacting like this. A lot of the interviews that I've seen with participants, I mean, these, <laughs> these are not stupid people, like they're being portrayed to be. You know, you're getting educated responses, you're getting people who are staying on message. And I guess the, the more that people stay on message, the more people say, hold up something shiny and try and distract from the message. And I guess it gets harder, potentially harder and harder to stay on message. 
and how do you know how um, I don't know if organizers are is the right word how people are getting people to stay focused in, on message well I went to a training just yesterday at the CUNY Grad Center uh, in Midtown and they were having um, direct action was having a training about that very thing about growing a movement how do you grow a movement and a big part of that is furthering your message uh, so staying on message about you know the division between rich and poor the growing gap how in the past 30 years that gap has widened uh, and how uh, legislation has been written to minimize workers rights and how essentially uh, the minimum wage has decreased in value because it hasn't kept up with the cost of living mm -hmm. um, so yeah these types of things how I think it's something like over 50 percent of Americans are cla classify as living in poverty now. So like these are things that are not really talked about in the news every day. Uh, you know, so much of, of the American um, machine is just the American dream and you can be, you know, it's, the, it's that lotto mentality that mm -hmm. you can be uh, the one percent, you can, you know, anyone can make it, anyone can come over. But the reality is that in the past 30 years, that, that has proven to, to be less and less so. Right, and, and the media shows you that lottery, per well, first of all, they love to show you the lottery winners, but they also love to show you the few people that have beaten the odds, you know. Right, but and everybody loves, everybody loves Self-made millionaires. Yeah. And they're obviously the exception, you know. I mean, yeah, going back, going back to March when there was a, over a half a billion dollar jackpot. Yeah, I saw a few articles about people who actually look at the lottery as a potential retirement plan instead of actually instead of actually trying to save what little they do earn. And it's it's tough. I mean, there's there's yeah, there's a dream and there's a reality. Yeah, and I think there's like a ripple effect too on families because if a father has to work two jobs, a mother has to work two or three jobs. Uh, then that diminishes your ability to be at home and be a parent. Uh, that puts a strain on a relationship of husband and wife, a strain on uh, do I even know my children? Um, and then if you want to go to school to take courses, okay, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll take that route and try to get a better job. You know, uh, so people are, are layering all these things on top of each other, and that has kind of a ripple effect that it erodes families. Hmm. Um, Whereas in the past, you know, like the 40-hour work week, which is now pretty much a myth, you know, the goal was for people to have that balance of, you know, you're working, you're making a living, but you also have a family. I think that's really the American dream, but uh, more and more that, that seems to be an impossibility for a lot of folks. Right. You're working the 40-hour work week at your first job, and then you know, if you have one, and then you might have the, the second evening job, and that's another 20 plus hours. Neither of which give you benefits, mm. right? Yeah, a lot of times that's the, the other side yeah, of it. If you have two part-time jobs, they're not gonna give you benefits. You mentioned that you went to, uh, you took a, a course at CUNY. Is there, like, can you give the viewers any kind of websites to hit up if they are interested in yeah, going um, to cl cl classes like that to yeah, get I educated about this? Yeah, um, nycga.net. New York City General Assembly dot net. Uh, they have um, the most up-to-date Occupy information uh, from marches to uh, workshops to courses um, and OccupyWallStreet.org. Uh, don't spell out the word street. Uh, S T. Yeah. Dot org. Uh, that site is also very informative. Because I think the worst thing people could do is not be educated about this. I think it, you become more of a a, I don't want to say tool, but <laughs> weapon, <laughs> I guess, if you're educated and you, and you, you get yourself some learning. But mm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think for me that's been one of the real draws uh, of what, what compelled me to be involved was I've learned probably more in the last six, seven months than I have probably since college just from being around, like you said, very learned people, very progressive people. Uh, that have caused me to kind of take a look at my own habits and and since I've I've gotten rid of my cable um, no offense to public <laughs> access but I got rid of my cable I got rid of my newspaper subscription just because I wanted to unplug from a lot of the things that mm -hmm. were um, 
either I felt time wasters or maybe not, you know, the best use of my time. Distraction. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I would say, too, uh, in relation to that is uh, when I reflect on, you know, my participation and uh, think about, you know, the people that uh, I'm with in Occupy Astoria and uh, at large, I think, you're mainly talking about people that uh, haven't been involved in activism, you know, like we're all new to this. Uh, and sometimes there's a tendency to think, you know, am I doing this right? It feels, you know, awkward or clumsy, you know, should I be this involved? Should I be getting arrested? You know, should, am I radical enough? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, have you been arrested? <laughs> I have not been arrested, but Teddy has. I don't know if he wants to share. <laughs> Yeah. His story. You just shared for him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of trepidation with people uh, that we would see, like around Zuccotti, you know, and just you get like the cheerleader kind of great job, you know, and then they keep walking, you know, and to it's their like, job well, in the finance industry. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, well, you could be on this side of things too, you know, you don't have to be over there on the sidewalk saying, you know, nice sign or, you know, keep it up, you know, great job, guys. Um, so there's that big hurdle, I think, and then, of course, since the police have instilled such fear, a lot of people, their first reaction is, I don't want to get arrested, you know? I, yeah, the, that two-pronged attack of the, the police and the media, uh, their messaging mm. scares people. You know, the, the thing we hear the most is, I don't want to get arrested. I, I, don't, I'm su I support you, but I don't want to get arrested, you know? Um, and most, more times than not, there's really no chance of being arrested. Only like in big marches and stuff, if you kind of go the wrong way, and you can kind of see where the trouble is brewing. Keep your eyes open. Yeah, steer clear. It, for the most part, it's very easy to know where you know the arrestable actions are. Uh, yeah, for me, I got arrested December 17th at Duarte Square. I climbed a fence with 50 or 60 other folks. Um, this was post eviction, where Occupy Wall Street was trying to claim this space that Trinity Church owns, that was unused space. So they were petitioning the church, can we please have this unused space as our, uh, as our kind of uh, um, home base? And the church repeatedly said no. So then on the 17th, folks, they set up a ladder, they climbed in. So it was trespassing, um, I guess is the charge, uh, still to be determined. But um, yeah, so I, I got arrested on the 17th for that. You guys are making it really clear. I hope. I hope people at home watching this aren't feeling afraid, but you're making it clear that it's just regular folks. It's just all of us. Yeah, it really... Regular people. It really is. It's we can do this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we often say that to each other, like, wouldn't it be interesting if just people showed up by the thousands and we just have this conversation? Mm. Because everyone knows something is wrong, uh, but not everyone is willing to just go down there and uh, hold a sign or... You know, there is that fear, that threshold that people have to cross. But the hopes for us that we often talk about is, as long as we keep showing up, um, maybe that will in some way inspire other folks to do the same. Um, but for us, it feels like, you know, uh, at least for me, I feel like I have no other choice as an artist and as a, an engaged citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I feel like this is my America for the first time, like post 9-11 and everything there was this view of what patriotism is and what America is mm. and it did not jive at all with what my values were uh, for me this is my first time of like this is the America that I believe in an America where it is equal opportunity and uh, we do look out for the less fortunate uh, all of the things that are being embodied down at Zuccotti right. Park. I think activism almost skipped two generations you know you had, you had the big surge in the 60s and then and now is, is probably the biggest swell since then and and that's on both sides of issues you know you have the corporate funded tea partiers and you have <laughs> and then you have the general uh, genuine civil uprising that is the Occupy movement yeah I've uh, I think that the country literally got depressed, let alone, you know, an economic depression. But I think Reagan and the two Bushes depressed us and mm -hmm. oppressed us to the point where we were silent, you know. And this is uh, a waking up now. 
and some people are like, well, you know, what, what's going on? Why do you guys have so many complaints? Or, or what are your complaints? Like, what, what's your list of demands? What, what are the problems? Well, come on now. You know the problems. They've piled up now over the last 30 years or so. So, um, yeah, I just think, uh, you know, and Obama's not, you know, a ray of sunshine. You know, if you really look at some of the things he's put into practice, especially within the last year or so. So it's incumbent upon people, you know, to get involved. Yeah, I mean, this the, is the, it, the it is a big election year. Yeah, the teabaggers talk about, oh, take America back, or, you know. Yeah, to the, to the 1940s. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, this is, I feel like this is an opportunity to really take our country back. Like, get involved. It's not just about voting, but, like, get in touch with your representatives. And, I mean, they, I remember we used to learn this stuff in school, and they don't teach that stuff anymore, like reading the Constitution, reading the Bill of Rights, and, you know, just knowing things. Right, and, I mean, we could go on for another full half hour. And then I'll get into <laughs> conspiracy theories and then forget it. If, if you express three things that you want to come out of the Occupy movement, what would it be? Start with Ted. I would say uh, for people to continue to show up, uh, to participate. That's number one, people to participate. Uh, Two would be um, that there is a uh, get the money out of uh, government and that, that perverse relationship between corporations and government so that the government represents the people and not the big money corporation, the corporate interests. Uh, and the third would be that it takes, it takes root at the local level, which is, you know, has happened with us with Occupy Astoria. Uh, we met some folks from Occupy Bushwick. Occupy Williamsburg, okay. um, so all, and there's, uh, we know some folks from Occupy Queens in Jackson Heights. Uh, these local occupations that, that meet regularly um, and, and discuss all these issues that we're talking about, I think that's an important element as well. You guys are getting and, yeah. <laughs> Anything um, further to add? I mean, we're running. Yeah, I'll just say a couple words. Uh, like, like Ted was saying, unplug from your uh, usual sources of media. I'd like to see a lot more people do that. Think for yourself, raise your intelligence, your consciousness. Um, showing up, uh, not being fearful to get educated, to show up. Take to, part, to learn. To get together, yeah. Part, again, participate, 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 and educate yourself. Uh, we're going to have links to the websites that we mentioned on the www.talkingabout.info website. You're both talented artists in your own right. We're going to have links to your sites as well. I really want to thank you for taking the time out of your thank schedules you. to, to thank come you. It was with really us. a pleasure. Thank you, guys. So, we'll see you again next time. I'm John Griffith. I'm Clark Hildup. Take care.